Welcome to Dev Jams. This is where we talk about innovative, inspiring, interesting projects that developers are building, specifically when it comes to delivering images and videos a lot of times on those websites. And of course, they probably are using Cloudinary for a lot of those aspects since this is a program that's developed by Cloudinary. My name is Sam Brace. I am the Senior Director of Customer Education and Community at Cloudinary. And this is going to be a really exciting program because we're going to be bringing on Adam Argyle, who happens to be a developer advocate, specifically under the Chrome side of things, specifically around CSS. But this isn't about his time at Google. This is actually about the work that he's been doing for his own personal brand through a URL called nerdy.dev. And he did this amazing overhaul to be able to create a space for him to be able to share blog posts and other musings. But he also did some pretty innovative things with new frameworks, new ways to be able to really, really push the boundaries of what's possible. I love the overall social networking look and feel that he did with this. And of course, he found new ways to be able to deliver images and even videos through his overall web presence, thanks to the work that he was able to do with implementing Cloudinary into his overall website blog overhaul. Joining me for every single one of these episodes, and I'm so happy to have her here for this one, is Jen Brisman. And she is a technical curriculum engineer here at Cloudinary and working with me on many customer education focused projects. So Jen, welcome to the program. Hey, happy to be here. So Jen, tell me, why are you excited to talk to Adam today? So many reasons. I mean, I love nerdy.dev. It has such a cool look. And I like that we have someone focused on CSS and the way that things look. We're not necessarily focused on um, uh, something super um, technical. It's it's really about making things look really good in the technical ways that he did. So happy to talk to Adam. And he's really fun to talk to. So let's let's get him on here. Absolutely. And before we do so, one thing that we should always point out is that if this is the first time that you're experiencing the Dev Jams program and maybe even Cloudinary, know that we have many years of podcast episodes and live streams that we have done associated with the Dev Jams program. And you can find all of those at cloudinary.com slash podcasts. So simply go through the list and see all of the podcast episodes that we have put out and explore. And on top of all of that, we can also see here that many conversations take place between Cloudinary users at community.cloudinary.com. And this is going to be a great place for you to continue the conversations about anything that me and Jen and Adam discussed today. Of course, also maybe conversations of things that got broached in previous episodes as well. So make sure that you have that. And whether you like to use the community forums or you happen to enjoy its associated Discord server, there is a place for you to have those conversations with other users that probably care about images and videos just as much as you do. So before all of that. And after all of that, let's get on Adam to the program. So Adam, thank you for joining. What's up? <laughs> so, what a corpus y'all have. That was awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, and, and honestly, it's great to have you here. This is going to be a really good exploration and a lot of different things. But I think what would be a great place for us to start at is just for everybody that hasn't heard about Adam Argyle to get a little bit of a flavor. Who are you? What are you up to? Um, how do we, how did we get you here? Cool. All right. I'll try to keep it short. Uh, been a nerd for a long time. I was a, a nerd before it was cool. And then I kind of dropped out. I was like, oh, being a nerd's not that cool. Look at, uh, we're nerdy. That's not great. And then later all of a sudden nerds were cool. And I was like, I'm going back to being a nerd. And I was really happy about it. Um, I studied all sorts of things in college and, and high school. I've been building sites for like 25 years. Uh, I, I was in like intense computer science college and noticed that no one else cared about what things looked like. Uh, and I was like, well, I, I do. And I would turn in assignments and they looked good and were functional. And they were all like, well, you're weird. And I'm like, you're weird. Why are you so happy with the math? Why can't you make little rock hands pop up and bounce around like we're playing a video game? And they're like, we don't care. And I was like, well, dang, I care. And so I switched schools. I was even like, I was like databases and you know, back end is really fun. Uh, and then I went to design school where I studied uh, web design and interactive media, 3D animation, all sorts of cool stuff. Meanwhile, while I was at uh, art school, I was at a startup agency and we were building apps for every digital screen. And I cut my teeth building um, everything. I've built an app for pretty much every device, every screen type, even voice apps and stuff like that. And I found myself more and more and more focused on the user 
I wanted the user to be empowered. That was the cool part about the web. The web was like mine. It was like that page showed up on my screen. It came with some of my preferences uh, and I wanted it to be, uh, you know, really beautiful. So as I implemented other designers, beautiful designs and studied design, and then I just kept building apps and working at various companies, found myself at Google after about 20 years. I've uh, been happily here. I started out on Google Cloud and the design systems team, um, which, by the way, has like 100 people on it just to manage the design system of Google Cloud. So if you think design systems are easy, they're going to save us a lot of work. Try again. They make <laughs> a lot of jobs and it turns out they're really, really hard. It's like a garden. You have to continually, you know, look after things rot and things grow and you have to be there with them and tend to them. Uh, these days I'm on uh, the Chrome team focusing on CSS, UI and dev tools. I work with a couple of amazing colleagues. I work with all the engineers. I work with the PMs. I work with the spec authors. And I'm in the middle of all this sort of synthesizing it, figuring out how to use it, uh, how to teach it. That's mostly what I do these days. It's a lot of teaching. And then I can't stop building. I'm just a crafter. I got to I got to build stuff. And so um, my personal site was getting a little crusty. It's the one that got me my job at Google. So I've been there for I've been at Google for like six years now. And after about five years, I was like, I should probably have a website that showcases a lot of the stuff that I talk about. That seems dog foodie. I'm going to eat some dog food. Um, and that led to nerdy.dev, the site you saw. And I was like, people love scrolling feeds. I'll just make my own feed with my own personas. I even added a persona uh, today. Uh, the idea came last week, but now I have an evil persona. So oh. that's the top post you'll see is evil Adam. And what's he going to do next? I have no idea, but something <laughs> evil is be really fun. Um, <laughs> right? So it's my site, my space. I get to do my CSS my way. I get to build it my way. Um, and I could also keep rambling for a long time. Uh, so I'm going to stop myself right there. I think that's pretty good. When it, it, it's something that we've heard actually a lot of times in the DevJams program is that someone wants to re-overhaul their overall web presence. And of course, I think you did something that many developers want to do. They want to own that space because we've seen social networks come and go. We've seen ones kind of rise. They allow certain types of customizations, not customizations. And so rather than kind of jumping from space to space to space, you know that everything that you want it to be the way you want it to be is at nerdy.dev. So it makes sense why you would do a lot of those things. But it also, we've seen this before where certain developers will use a chance to check out maybe a new framework or a new way of being able to just, you know, looking at fresh code. It's, it, it gives you a blank canvas to work off of something. So it seems like possibly that's one of the approaches you took too, because I saw that you're working with Dino, you're working with Fresh. You're doing all of these fun things with your framework choices, but that was something that probably came about because you were just deciding to revitalize your overall web presence. Yep. I've been building with frameworks since the frameworks got created. Um, and so I kind of like to use a different one for each project. Um, like a couple months ago, I released a project called gradient.style, which allows you to build um, wide gamut gradients. So it's a brand new gradient syntax. It'll output the old and the new syntax for you. But um, that was built on SvelteKit. I'd already liked Svelte from a project about three years ago. And Gradient.Style just ended up being this, you know, I, I like building tools. I like building design tools too. And I just wanted the web to have a really good gradient. Anyway, so I used SvelteKit. Um, I've built things with Next.js. I've built things with uh, just everything. And so Dino was especially uh, interesting to me because they're on the web platform tests website. So the every browser, before they release a build, they test their code against hundreds and thousands of tests. And they're called the web platform tests. And Dino showed up in there uh, next to Node and next to other things. And I was like, Dino's here. Dino is implementing web standards and they're crushing it. And they're a tiny version of Node with TypeScript out of the box. And I was like, and it, well, and it renders at the edge, right? So it's got all these kind of cool advantages. And I was kind of immediately in love. I was like, this is like all the fun part of, D of uh, Node where it's JavaScript, very familiar with the NPM package uh, registry, all sorts of cool stuff there. Um, but I get to be in this more minimal scenario, uh, in this modern distributed sort of architecture. And then they also came out with a framework for themselves called Fresh, which is a preact, very minimal framework, which I'm a very minimal, uh, enthusiast. I like to build things myself. So that way I understand what's going on. And so they gave me that and I was like, oh, I'll give it a shot. And it turned out to be stellar. I've had a great time in Dino and Fresh. The deployments are sometimes seconds. So I'll push code to GitHub and I'll go check production and voila. There's my site. It rendered on demand. It does SSR. Um, yeah, here's Fresh. It's really, really rad. Um, and I've had a blast. So yeah, every new project, I like to pull in a new framework, expand my 
uh, repertoire and, and places that I've been and things that I've seen. It just makes me a, a better coder. Plus, I get to feel like I'm relating with what other people are probably building with. Um, and yeah, I, I think it also shows some clout that I'm not just here um, in a little silo, you know, shouting out about CSS and how you need to architect things. Um, I get to go try these things in the same space that they are and feeling the same pains that they are too. And I, I don't know, it's just, I can't, I can't stop doing those things. They're just a part of me, I guess. Well, and I think it, like, it, it definitely shows, I love the growth behind that. Like it's something where, as we know, there's, as you pointed out, there's new frameworks that pop up all the time. There's new programming languages that become the new hot thing where people want to learn these things and knowing how, you know, the pros and cons, reasons why you might want to use it, the reasons that you don't, it makes for much more nuanced conversations when you're in an education role like yourself. So I think it's really astute that you decide to jump in, try something out and use different projects. I love the fact that you tried Spelt for something else that was a passion project. So there's really cool things that you're doing with that. So that's very, very good advice, I think, for any developer to be able to take. Thanks a bunch. I, I always felt like a senior developer has experienced more bugs than you. And that's, uh, they're still writing bugs. They just have seen more of them. And so they go, oh, Oh, that happened to me last year. I know the fix and they do it. So that's like one attribute of a senior. And the other one is trade-off management. They know um, what's at the end of all these different roads because they've walked down them. So I'm going to keep walking down roads and keep collecting those uh, experiences because I feel like that's what makes me a stronger engineer over and over again. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that you also did with the overall rebrand or rebuild of nerdy.dev was of course you decided to start finding new ways to work with images and videos. And because you, of course, it's a, being a very well-designed website, it has really fun imagery, as we pointed out, like you have a great icon, which is the skull with like the flipped lid and you've got all sorts of stuff going on there. So you want that to look good. You want that to come through quickly. Um, so it looks like you chose Cloudinary for that. What were the reasons that led you down the path to choose Cloudinary? Yeah, I've used Cloudinary in the past. So when I was at Deloitte, uh, when I was at agencies, we'd use Cloudinary. Um, it's just nice to, I mean, there's many niceties, but one of the main ones is, um, well, and then I've also used Eleventy and all sorts of other build systems where I would build out my images. I've been in the Squoosh CLI and the Squoosh website, just like exporting all these different versions, handwriting the source sets and, and picture elements. And it just became a big pain. And, and all of it, again, for me, it's like I'm a very user-focused builder. I want the user to have a good experience. And so images and video end up being this humongous asset that you download in order to experience a site. Um, and as a author, I want to upload the highest res image and on the fly, give people all the, the little ones. I think my first and best experience with Cloudinary was with a startup that I was at called Lively. And Lively was a, we would record the live show that you were at, um, all the audio right off the soundboard. And by the time you were walking out of the show, you could buy the show that you were just at for five bucks. That's pretty and cool. We had, it was super cool. <laughs> I saw so many shows. Um, but the album art and all this stuff was really hard to deliver across all these platforms. This was a, a while ago. And Cloudinary made it really easy so that I could, um, again, just upload one high-res asset from these artists because it's a pain getting images from clients, right? I get one of the best that I could. And then I would just downscale it and fit it to each user's device. And then those get cached on the fly and all subsequent pulls are super instant. Uh, so it's just superpowers galore. And so when I'm on uh, my personal side, it's like, of course, I want to do that. Managing images and media and video is not easy. People are like, oh, you just download an image. You just put one in your pictures folder. You know, oh, I have an assets folder and I'll just serve that. And that is totally fine. And that does work. Um, but as you dig into sort of these user necessities and moments that they have with various things, whether it's like I have GIFs that only play three times, right? Um, I think that's really important because it can get annoying if they're sitting there doing that over and over again. Um, I have client headers are sent that send your viewport that you're viewing it on so that I'll never send you an image bigger than your viewport. Like just the amount of little things that you can do to tweak that asset for that user is bonkers. And y'all give me an API into that. I just build strings. Um, I do it all on the server side. So that by way, by the time the user gets it, it's just HTML. I don't even use JavaScript to serve any of my images. Um, I did I did prototype that at one point. I was using the LQIP images and then you know, okay. showing the blurry one and then loading the big one. Um, anyway, so there's just so many niceties to using something like Cloudinary, right? You get CDNs at the edge, transformations on the fly that get cached. I mean, the list just goes on. And so, of course, I was going to use it again. Um, it's pretty much top notch for, for doing this sort of work. As long as you 
can read the docs and and sift through and and formulate these strings and and build them. Um, and yeah, that's what I did in codes. That's what code's good for. You're like, hi, code. Uh, this is confusing. I'm going to teach you so that you do it for me. And that's very good at that. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and we're, we're showing on the screen here, various parts of nerdy.dev. And you can see that we've got videos that you're bringing through for different things that you're showing. You've got pictures of yourself. You've got various, but all of these images, all these videos that we can see that are part of this overall scrolling feed that are here, they're all coming from Cloudinary. So, um, and when I take a look at some of these, so if I just pull up our handy dandy media expector, let's take a look at this user-centered UI plug that you have here for your, your Google IO speak. You can see here that, yes, sure enough, this is coming from Cloudinary, and you can see all of the transformations that are being brought through, like F Auto and Q Auto and W Auto. I mean, there's a lot of fun things that you're putting into this. So I think this is definitely showing that it, you, you're fully embracing the whole process of image and video through us, which is a great thing to see. There's uh, even more. If you click that image, it should go uh, into a modal view. Ooh. And that was a sep that's a separate path. So uh, stashed on the element is the full URL, the one that's kind of unfettered. So you should media inspect that one because that has less constraints applied to it. It's like, yes. oh, you invoked the large image. Here is, <laughs> you know, I think it's still using client headers and stuff, but it's like, here's the, here's the big one. You paid for that one kind of when you clicked it. I mean, you didn't pay for it, but you know, like that was more to download than the initial one. And it's higher quality. You get to zoom in on the details. Ah, see like one like that. You're like, that's nice to be able to zoom in on the details. Oh yeah. This is fantastic. Yeah, this is very, very good work. And I like that you exposed a little Easter egg that I didn't even know existed. And I've been combing your website for a while here. So <laughs> and that's kind of neat. So I was just very satisfied to look at how nice it looked just in the scrolling view. I didn't even think about it. So well, Adam, I yeah, like Sam said, I love the look of your website. What gave you the idea to make it look like a social media feed? Hmm. Yeah, um, it was a lot of observation. So a lot of people have been making new portfolio sites. Um, as much whimsy as I generally like to build, well, I'd build tools and I build whimsy. I was like, for my site, I kind of, um, I was like, everyone's just scrolling cards. And I ultimately wanted a kind of content centric site. I knew I was going to blog and I knew I wanted to make posts. They're called notes in my code, but like, uh, like the one at the very top where I'm like evil Adam or whatever, that was just a note. It's not a blog post. All right. And you can go, you can go to the detail and it's like, it's just a note. Um, the idea was like people are scrolling a feed they just want to see a feed of cards and so someone can come to my site and they'll be like don't care don't care oh that one i care about you know and then the sidebar uh, was just like twitter and i'm like there's so many people on twitter there's probably a lot of people coming from twitter to my site um i might as well just kind of make it really familiar that way that way there's not a lot to learn um i can keep it really simple um and that was sort of the inspiration just observing the way that people are consuming content these days i wanted to uh, give it to them in a nice familiar format, but also do it my way, which is, so there's a lot of atomisms in there. Like, did you notice as you scroll, the avatar stays sticky inside the card? There's just like lots of little, little things like that, that I, I had fun with. And the colors, there's a lot of display P3 colors. Uh, like if you hover on those filters on the left, those are using the brightest colors that you can get from your screen. So oh, yes, they are. Brightest, I am brightest green. Yeah. And uh, so it's a little different on his screen than on ours, but in person, those are like, that's a really juicy neon color. Um, <laughs> and so I got to, I got to go use my, so again, that's like very dog fooding. I do a lot about color talk at, uh, at Google. And so I was like, well, I'm going to have some nice candy colors on my site. Um, but yeah. I think this is great. I think this would be really, what I would love to see is some of the ways that you were able to put this together. So what I, what I plan on doing is I'll take down my screen and showing off all your great work and you can pop it over to yours so you can show us everything that you've been up to and maybe give some people some insights on how they can do this on their own. Sure. All right, so there's Adam. All right, so let's take a look at this. So this is the pick component, and it ultimately builds the picture element that will contain all of the different sort of information. And so like, here's a nice little TypeScript interface, kind of gives you a preview of the different options that you can pass in. So it requires a string. Um, alt is optional, though I generally supply alt as often as I can height and width, class style, and Cloudinary. So the Cloudinary string is interesting because you can pass overrides. Um, like up here, you can see there's some defaults. Do you see the Google's like, you need to update your operating system. I'm like, no, not today. I'm going to do it later. <laughs> it might pop, again, pop up again. We'll see. But here's like my standard optimizations here. 
or I've got format auto, which is going to let me, you know, supply whatever the browser is capable of. I got C limit, uh, quality auto and width auto. And those things are going to play really nicely with the client hints that I send to. And just really quick on client hints. Those are over here in a, a bunch of confusing looking markup right here, right? So except CH, we have content. So these are the different client hints I'm opting in to send along with my headers to Cloudinary. So I don't have to put these in my requests. I don't have to put them in the URL for the image. They get sent with the headers and y'all have an intelligent enough server to look at these properties and return with something that's um, relevant to the, the factors here. So I've got the size of the viewport, like I was saying earlier, will never show an image that's bigger than your viewport, which is nice because I'm uploading some 20, you know, 2000 or 3000 wide pixel images sometimes, and you don't have to pay for that. Uh, just the regular width, which is doing its best, it can get the width off the image element itself. So there's a reason to put another reason to put the width property on your images. Downlink is how good the internet connection is. So that gives you all an opportunity to change the quality and the DPR. So um, what's the pixel ratio quality that they have? And make sure to give a, give me a 3x if these folks are on something super nice. Yeah. And that's so, um, and then there's also a bunch more here uh, to kind of support that additionally. So that's like the client hints. But the cloud in here allows me to do overrides. And sometimes I will do overrides because like maybe in the moment, I know better than what the optimizations are. Um, and that gives me the opportunity to populate that. So custom styles, custom classes, alt text, and then these like bases here. And then here's the Elquip base, which I'm not using anymore. But this was really cool. Like I can blur it 2000 pixels, make sure it's a thumbnail, still auto format. So I'm getting nice and small image formats depending on the browser's capability. Uh, with auto and quality looking low, right? Because I need a, I need something to deliver super duper fast to just provide the the scent or the hint of what the image will be eventually, and then I'll you know do a tricky swap. Uh, but it ended up being I was like, y'all serve images fast enough, and I don't want to put JavaScript in there just to serve my images. Uh, and then I also don't want to do conditional JavaScript that looks to see if you do have JavaScript enabled. And blah, 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 blah. I was just like. You, you, you all got me covered, so I'll just ship that uh, high quality one. But it's just still cool to know that the transformations are just a, a, a string, you know, a few commas and some properties away. Um, so when a when a picture component gets used, I get my pass in a bunch of props. I extract things from so this pick paths is going to go basically take those uh, base paths that we were looking at before, all the optimizations, yeah. merge them with the actual path of the image that I passed in, and return me like I was showing you earlier that full image. So that one's sort of unfettered and you're going to get that high quality, large modal image, uh, a custom one, which is going to be a mixture of whatever cloudinary ones I passed in, in combination with the base ones, and then the placeholder. Uh, and those get extracted from this function pick paths. I also have this here too, which is my site is, um, if you remember the cards, they max out on their width. And so you could have a, a monitor that's widescreen and I'm still only basically going to be filling up the inner column, which means I'm very I have high confidence in the max size of that column. It's in my media queries. So I'm able to give that information to um, the API and saying like, look, it's either going to be like 100 uh, or it's going to go up to 350 on mobile. I've got medium and large. Or have you have y'all heard of the Goldilocks approach? Mm. So I like I know what Goldilocks is, but tell me the Goldilocks approach is. You, you know, you got like your daddy bed, mama bed, baby bed. Yeah, and that's pretty much a, a a fun way to work with or think about your media queries. You've got your your daddy screen, your mommy screen, and then your baby mobile screen. And so those kind of are what these map to here. So I've got like large, medium, and small. Yeah. Um, and so then this component's going to return an image. Obviously, that's what it's got to do. Uh, always put loading lazy on there unless you're worried about LCP and you're trying to put something up in the main header area, which I don't have. So all of mine are pretty much lazy. Here's that data full attribute we were talking about the alt props, the source that we've established, uh, that we built customized uh, during the SSR build process, height and width, styles, decoding async, which is like another fun little optimization. You can tell the browser, like you don't have to stop when you're kind of drawing and processing this. I'm probably describing that a little wrong, but it just kind of frees up the browser to be like, oh, I'll come to this later. Maybe it's not needed this second. I'll come back to it. Kind of like loading lazy. If it's not in the viewport, the rest of the information on this image don't matter. And then I've got source set and sizes. And so these are additional ways for me to tell the browser, um, you know, what it is that I, I'm giving it additional information again to like attach to the headers and, it, and know for itself that it can size something as small as possible for this mobile user, but also grow 
for a larger set. And that's that uh, the information that we see there. I think down below here is just kind of where I build the strings. So this is again a kind of confusing JavaScript. I'm making sure it is a cloudinary image by looking for my folder. So you all nice. give me a folder. I put everything in the folder and that's how I, um, that's my hook basically to know if it's coming from cloudinary or not. And then I check if something's a GIF because if it's a GIF, well, I actually want to serve that as an MP4. It's going to be a lot smaller. You all do it on the fly. I can limit the amount of loops. There's all sorts of good stuff to have there. Um, and so I can also generate a placeholder with you all on the fly. So I can show an immediate image. And then if they want to watch it, like, anyway, just lots of really cool little details you all give me the ability to do. When, of course, um, the, I, to unpack it down a little bit, I mean, the reason why you would want to serve a GIF as MP4 is because of size in most cases, right? Like yeah. you're saying like, well, a GIF normally fat, a little bit bloated in some cases in terms of what it is, but we can make that look exactly the same way, but deliver it as a video. And then suddenly it becomes a lot more lightweight. Is that the same reasoning that you did it as well? Yeah. Yeah, it was for size, um, mostly. Um, and that you y'all make it so easy. So um, I might as well. And I think I only have a couple of GIFs, um, but it's nice in case I want to embed a GIF. Yep. So if I've got a blog post that I write and I want to put a GIF in there, um, I can have it transformed on the fly. Just put it in my bucket, pull it down and apply some optimizations. Um, but yeah, that's a pretty good overview of like my pick component that powers a lot of the images. And here, yeah, I'll just leave it at this spot right here. Yeah, I think this is really, really powerful what you've shown here because it explains that all you need to do is make sure that you're uploading your files properly to Cloudinary. And then a lot of the transformation work has been very scripted out so that you don't have to worry about, did I apply this parameter or is this being optimized or is this not being optimized? So there's a lot of things that you're doing to make sure that this is streamlined and automated really as much as possible. So there's a lot to like yeah. about this. We could look at usage really quick. So if I open up, like, what's a good blog post? Um, Oh, let's see, gradient.style. Uh, maybe this will have one in it. Oh, well, here's a good example. So even the like the markdown posts have a hero and the source, look, it's prefixed with Argyle link. So I know that it's coming from Cloudinary. So I can go fetch it and build out this nice hero image, which is a little bit, oh, look, here's the size of that one was 2,144 pixels wide. I doubt anyone sees it at that size because I think I max out the width of my entire blog post at a certain size, but still, these are just inline um, initial attributes that the browser uses for a ratio. It's not actually going to draw them at that size. It's going to look at CSS and make something smarter. Um, and look, oh, here, look at this. I didn't even plan that, but here's what kind of like an image looks like. So I've got a little bit of a secret sauce in my markdown that I can use, but I pass the path to my folder and then the name of the item. Oh, it looks like I adjusted some code. Pass the name of the image. This is my alt text. And then at the end, I use a double, double, uh, dollar sign nice. to denote the inline height and width attributes. So that way I know that even though they're coming through Markdown, they're not going to cause any layout shift. Um, they're going to get embedded and have a proper ratio. And then I'll go cloud and area them and, and, and grab them at the best size that they can. And that's the same for videos pretty much too. I don't know if there's a video in here. Yeah, look, here's a simple image. So that one I didn't apply alt to. Um, anything else? No, just a couple of code pen embeds. When one um, of the transformations that I yeah. saw that you use is C limit as well, which is like an excellent way to make sure that you never accidentally upscale that image past what it should ever be. I mean, I know that you were putting in huge images, so why would you ever upscale something that it was, you know, 2,100 pixels in width? But you have that as that parameter saying, if I ever make a, you know, an error and I add an additional zero or something like that, then don't worry, it, it's going to catch it and make sure it never serves it past the original either. So there's really smart things that you're putting into the overall optimization. It's but it really is, you have a true set and forget it type of optimization layer, which is great. Yeah, yeah you have lots, into the code. Yeah, you have lots of parameters passed in on page load. Um, and I also just, I mean, just even going through, if you scroll down um, to uh, when you're using, uh, let's see, a little bit further down. Yeah, I mean, you're, well, you, uh, when you're using, you're just using a lot of cloudinary features. And I was just wondering as we were going through them, how you, figured it all out because we talked to a lot of awesome developers that are using Cloudinary in some cool ways, but then they're missing some really important ways. And they're just like, oh, I just never found out about it. But somehow, Adam, you found out about like all these little um, lesser known Cloudinary features. And it, is it just because you're a tinkerer or is it just because you're focused on the user or you just want to optimize? Like, how did you find out about all of these Cloudinary features? That is a very good question. Um... A lot of it starts with like the base of, I work with um, HTML engineers, so they're building the HTML spec. I get to watch 
image features land in the browser. And y'all do a very good job at watching what's going on. And you start implementing those features as soon as you can. Like you have some special Chrome only um, information. Like I think client hints are, they're a spec, but they're only implemented in Chrome right now. They might be in Firefox. Anyway, uh, y'all, y'all were on top of it. You were like, huh, more ways to optimize? You're like, here, let's give that to developers. Um, and so I've, I follow those. And then I go looking for those in your docs. And I'm like, ah, I need to know how do I pass these things to, to take care of, of all of this superpower stuff that I know the browser can do, all this communication that can happen between the server and client. I want that. Again, because I wanted the user to have it and I wanted to dog food these things. Uh, so I scoured the docs, you know, read each kind of parameter one by one. I was like, oh yeah, I want that one. And just add a comma. And then, oh, I want that one too. And add a comma. But there's a secret sauce, uh, which is y'all have a DevRel and his name's Colby and he's very cool. Yes. Uh, and, and so I was, you know, showing my site. I was like, I used Cloudinary and he popped it open and was like, oh, hey, you could do this. I was like, oh, gasp. I would, I would love to do that. And then he'd be like, oh, if you tweak this one little pram right here, you can get that. I'm trying to remember. He might've been the one that told me to put C-Limit in there. Um, oh, if he did, I, he, he deserves all the awards. It's a great transformation. So that's a good job, buddy. What else did he have in there? Anyway, so I also, so that was like some secret sauce. I got a direct line to your uh, excellent DevRel who helped me kind of really hone it. So it's like, I'd done a good job. It's not like I'd, I'd done poorly. I'd implemented a lot of great things. Um, but that last little mind, those are also the things I love being like a user experience oriented engineer. I'm like, oh, the little things are really important to me. So I got some special help from one of my friends uh, and their name's Colby. Well, his friend now wasn't a friend before, but yeah. Cool. Yeah, so Colby's basically for, everybody's friend, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Everyone knows and loves Colby and I, and I totally agree. I'm one of those people. Um, so before the, you know, secret superpower of Colby, you decided something you wanted to do and then went in the docs to see if it was possible. Is that the order or you found out something that was possible and then went into the docs to figure out how to do it? Yes, okay, so some things like data saver and client headers, like I knew all in client hints, I knew what client hints were and I'd never implemented them before. So again, like me being the sort of explorer that just wants to always adopt things and try them out and, and get a sense of what the trade-offs are. I went reading your client hints docs, which were pretty new at the time. I, mm -hmm. I think they're still even Maybe they changed or I think I found a bug at one point too, where I was like, hey, I tried to pass this. And they were like looking at my server requests being like, oh, that client information, that client headers are there. What are we doing? And, um, having a conversation back and forth there. Uh, but Data Saver was one that um, I'm a little partial to that one. I, I'm w one of the spec editors of the concept of Data Saver in CSS, but that's like in your browser or in your operating system, you can indicate that you are in a, a tight Wi-Fi scenario or tight data network. And so you don't want to use a lot. And you can send that along with requests and servers can see that um, and be like, oh, this user doesn't want to download my huge images, for example, or something like that. Let's make sure to give them something low quality or or maybe nothing at all, or you know, just the alter, all sorts of there's all sorts of like fun moments that happen after that. So I went looking at um, can I do data saver client hints with Cloudinary? Uh, and sure enough, it was there. Um, but I think that's the one where it had an issue and I needed to add some special header. Like we were looking at that funky uh, syntax here in the page meta. Mm -hmm. This took a lot to figure out. I can see this that. Yeah. Sec car with this sec. Chip, oh, this is the client hints DPR client hints with uh, client hits viewport. Oh, that's what it was too. Is all this all has to match this and it has to be in the same order. So there was like a combination of things I had to do that uh, y'all were also looking for. You know, it's just the, the, the classic code dance. Um, and so I was trying to early adopt the idea of data saving and using client hints and scouring those docs. I even think I got a direct line with through Colby to your engineer who's working on those. Um, and we got to go back and forth looking at, a, at the server logs, looking at the, the headers on my images. They're looking at the headers oh, on my cool. images. Um, and it was really cool. And we ended up, finding some little tweak that optimized it for both of us or whatever. And it was like, oh, wins, wins for everybody. Um, that's cool. So that, yeah, I was trying to early adopt scouring docs, had good lines to folks. Y'all are very available, which is really nice. Um, and so that's how that came about. Yeah. One thing I did want to ask you about, because like I can look at your screen now, obviously, if anybody knows what TSX is, you know, that's TypeScript. I, what I, I'd like to ask more about is just like, 
the choices of using TypeScript, was it also because of the framework as well? Because I know like Dino pushes a lot, like they do lots of TypeScript support and whatnot. Like what was, it, what was the reasoning for this when you're going down to their website side? Awesome question. So yeah, all in all, I generally don't like TypeScript. And it's not that I don't like it. It's just that I like computers to do the work for me. And when I have to type things, I'm doing a lot of the computer's work for it. And then I'm just like, bones <laughs> okay. me out. Um, but okay, so, but Dino comes with it pre-built. So one of the, one of the bummers of TypeScript is taking care of TypeScript. It's kind of needy sometimes. It, it, it can, needs a lot of configuration to be customized or whatever. It has all these different sort of needs. And so the trade-offs for me were always like, I'm spending too much time in TypeScript. I'm not getting the value back. Um, but with Dino, it's all built in. You don't have to manage it at all. There's nothing that I had to set up. It's out of the box. Um, and then again, I like to early adopt things. This isn't my first um, TypeScript TSX or like TypeScript JSX project. I've done a couple of them before, but this one was mine. And so that was nice. I got to do it my way. So these days I call, call myself a light typer. As you can see, there's light amounts of types. I have some interfaces uh, and I have like some typed parameters, um, but I'm not going overkill. I remember the first time I was learning TypeScript, um, which I come from a, a strong typed language. I learned Java um, as like my first language. And so, I've, and ActionScript 3, it was like a really big language for me for many years. So I was so happy to drop types. And then all of a sudden it was cool to type again. I was like, no, we move <laughs> forward. Okay, anyway, that's just still me ranting, but it comes with the framework and fresh. So a lot of it's uh, out of my hair and I got to do light typing, which was, you know, minor amounts of confidence in my builds or minor amounts of confidence in what am I passing between all my components and stuff like that. Um, and so that was the reason for that. It came with Dino Fresh and Dino is a TypeScript centric um, edge server to begin with. Yeah. I think it's cool. I think, and, and I, I, I like, I like the trade-off there. That, that, that it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Like fun, fresh framework, no pun intended, but then also getting to be able to say like, but I have to do some TypeScript, but I can also get what I want out of it. So that's, that's cool. Very, very yep. cool. And I kind of love the fact that, I mean, maybe this is intentional, maybe not, but like, if, like, like the color scheme of your IDE all seems to match the color scheme of nerdy.dev. Was that intentional or did, did you make your oh, own yeah. color scheme? Uh, I have made my own color theme. Um, it's called, um, oh, geez, I'm going to forget the name of it. It's, uh, what was the movie where they, a lot of Kung Fu, it's on Netflix, uh, Kung Fury. Kung oh, Fury is Kung the name Fury. of the theme. I don't know if you remember that. It was a, actually, it was a Kickstarter. Um, and then they got picked up on Netflix because it was so successful. But anyway, it's very tongue in cheek, um, a retro wave type of thing. And it had all these super rad neon colors and stuff. So I built a theme based on that. Uh, this particular theme, like I normally wouldn't put a vibrant yellow in mine, um, but someone else made one. I also have a, a YouTube series called GUI Challenges, which yeah. is always using my Kung Fury theme in Sublime. And people commented on like all the time. They, generally don't like it uh, but some people are like super in love with it like the things not to like which are things that are important to me and this one doesn't have it as much is i try to if the syntax is correct i push all the noise away like quotes uh curly brackets mm. semicolons colons uh, commas i do like to keep um because like i just as a as a scanner of the code that's all noise i just want to be like imports pick path from there's the path like the rest of it is all just junk to get the job done so my code syntax highlighting is always pushing the junk away as long as it's good because if it's bad it highlights in red uh, so that's my mantra and somebody built this theme and i was like they and it's uh, my vs code theme is very out of date at this point my sublime theme is very nice and up to date and this one was made oh what is the name of this one anyway someone built it inspired from gui challenges and I was like, y'all did a really good job. I sent them a message. It's like, I'm using your theme now in my VS code. And they were like, oh, <laughs> I was like, well, you you go. Go. I got to do it. Um, but yeah, it does all match uh, the science, the purples, the pinks. That's good stuff. As every good designer should carry the design across all elements. Excellent work there, Adam. I like yeah. That. And I knew like, OK, so obviously I think Sam was saying, I think it's intentional, probably knowing that it very much was intentional. But like I knew, OK, like not to not to take a turn here but like I knew how your code made me feel I'm like wow this is so clean I love this I feel like very safe with with Adam's code right now and I'm looking at his website and it looks like very beautiful and clean and what you said before it's simple and intentional and minimal but just beautiful and and appealing and it just makes you feel good 
And as much as like developers, I know a lot of incredible developers that are like, I don't I don't do like design or I can't be bothered with that. And that's that's fine and great. But I do think it matters even on the the Dino website that we were just looking on before. I'm like, this looks really pretty. I like this like minimal vibe we have going on here. And it does matter. And I love that that's so much of what you talk about, Adam, and, and color and and all of this, because even just in this podcast and and looking at your stuff, I'm like, this all just feels good. Even your background, even your colors behind you, like you just oh, yeah. it not, <laughs> makes you look so good and safe and 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 it's fun and, and fresh. And I just love it. So this is maybe something I was going to say after you left the show, but um, had to give you some compliments um, in real time because it just it just all feels so good. Yeah. Thanks so much. Uh, I, I mean, I follow in the footsteps of some other great people where they were like, I just found this cool uh, uh, font for my code. And I was like, and it was like, I remember Operator Mono and it was like 150 bucks to buy it. And I was like, oh, I'm not going to buy that. Um, but I, I did buy Dank Mono and that's what I've been bringing with me for all these years. And so that's the font in here is Dank Mono, which has cool Fs and it has the uh, kind of yeah, like, yeah, uh, was- cursive-ish um, italics and stuff. And yeah, look at from, right. That's just pretty. And I was like, I got to have it. Oh yeah. Back when, uh, uh, ligatures were just coming out when the arrow was connected mm. to the, the greater than I was like, Oh, I gotta have that. That's just too slick. Um, yeah. And I've never seen a theme where it strips out, like if the syntax is correct. And I was wondering, I'm like, well, how do you know if it's not? So it gives you red and, and squiggly underline of doom and you know to fix it. But when it's right, like how yeah. it just strips it away. Like, I think, I think that's awesome. I've I've never seen that. And I'm gonna I'm gonna get one of those themes for myself. <laughs> Maybe yours. Yeah. Do it. Kung Fury. Uh, and ping me after the show. I'll tell you which one this is on v- VS Code in case you're uh, in VS Code. Uh, yeah, for sure. I am on VS Code. Cool. Well, and I think the thing that's great about the project in many in many ways is that I mean we're 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 touching lots of different things right, as we're going through this. I mean, obviously we talk about the images and the videos, but I think the nice thing is that if people go to your site, nerdy.dev, and they take a look at the blog post where you talked about new year, new site, it happened, of course, on January 1st, so not hard to track it down. It's to say there's lots of things that you break down, like the fact that you've been able to handle fun ways to handle light and dark modes, and you have all your commenting done through web mentions, and the way you handle analytics is also a little bit groundbreaking, at least in my opinion. So it's where I hope people don't just say like, oh, this is a chance to talk about fun ways to do images and videos properly. But it's also to say, like, if you're not so inclined on the image video side, you want to cover other things, I think there's lots of little pockets and rabbit holes you can go down in that blog post that can really teach you a lot about ways to really enhance any website, let alone a personal blog post. So I'm very impressed by the work that you've been doing, Adam. So if this is people's first foray into what you're doing, Goodness gracious, you, there's going to be a lot that they can uncover with the great work you're putting out there. Thanks so much. I appreciate that a lot. It's really nice. So, Adam, since you are a developer, you've been doing this for years. You've been developing, as you said, you've done lots of websites. So you have your time at Google getting to work with some probably the brightest and best in the field. What do you feel like? Is there any like big takeaways to say like people should be focusing on X or Y or like maybe inspiration for the developers out there that are saying, I've heard a lot. What, are, what should I be doing? What can I do with this information? Anything like that? Ooh, I have a... I know, the spot lot block, the floor is yours. A lot of different <laughs> rants are right. Mm-hmm. Let's see. I think uh, a good one to mention is that there's a lot of conversation around DX versus UX. Mm. And I feel like I'm a weirdo in this conversation. So, like, I obviously uh, I have a lot of DX in mind. I've got my own syntax themes that I use. Um, you know, I've, I've developed my own way to work with TypeScript. Um, I'm trying out all these different frameworks, looking at their DX, looking at Cloudinary, experiencing the developer experience of Cloudinary. And these things um, I directly use to impact my UX, but I also don't, I don't attribute the success of my user experiences from my tools. Um, so like kind of what I want to do is help us split things out. Like we're kind of doing a disservice to the user experience industry and the developer experience industry by trying to say that like one leads or one rules the other one um and and so i want to just share that like as a user experience designer um that's all they do and they're doing way more than you could ever do building it into vs code the things that they think about the things that they care about um it complements everything that you're going to eventually build into this tool so like dx can't exist without ux being thought of first um and so just i would implore folks to really focus on your user 
um, what put yourself in their shoes. Think about what it would be like to to not have a mouse and to only be able to use a keyboard. Um, what would it be like if the light theme gave you migraines? Um, all sorts of things like that. And that, you know, data saver mode, like I was saying, that's like, that's really important to me that folks visit my site and I'm not going to be like, here's 140 images that are all about five megabytes each. Um, that would be rude. So I got loading lazy on there and then I'm doing all this optimization and then they load my site. They're like, oh good. This was only, you know, a light amount on my data plan, which is really nice. So, um, orient yourself to the user and you'll be happier. Compare yourself and compete less with other people and you'll be happier. That's my message, I guess. I like it. I like it a lot. And I think it is something that it's so, it's so easy for anybody, I think, in the tech space, regardless actually of what your role is, to be so heads down and focused on the tasks that are at hand that they don't think to themselves, how is this going to impact the person that's actually going to have to use this thing that I'm building or working on? So I think constantly putting your self in the shoes of the person that's going to be experiencing whatever you're working on is a, a great focus area. And um, I love that, that area to say, think about the user and developers can help drive that engagement for the users. So I love the, the, we're, we're the all mirroring the between the two. Yep. This is cool. Yeah. This is cool. Yeah, we're all in it together. You know, like you're talking about working with Colby, all the people available at Cloudinary, like teamwork makes the dream work. But also like, it's not just about making something work. A lot of developers, their mindset is like, the, the first thing you have to do is let's make this work. But then the next step, which I feel like, Adam, you're all about is how does it make you feel? Is it going to stress you out, give you a migraine, uh, make you, you know, use uh, you know, a bunch of data? Like, wh how is this going to make the user feel? And that feels like a kind of new-ish concept uh, in the not new. I don't know what new means, but like, um, I hope we see a lot more developers focusing on the stuff that you're focusing on uh, going forward. Thanks so much. I, a metaphor I like to say is you could you could give me two cars and one has a just the latest, coolest engine. It's so fast, hyper optimized, uses one dollar's worth of gasoline and goes a thousand miles or whatever. And I sit in it and it's all squeaky. Uh, and then I try steering the steering wheel and I'm like, it's kind of weird and uncanny. And then, you know, the interface is all weird. I'm just like, I sorry, you lost me. Your car is dead to me now. I'm going to go with the car that I sat in that was comfy and might be mildly less good in some other ways. It's just, that's how we are as users. At the end of the day, the performance factors uh, don't apply as much as a vibe. This is like Bauhaus used to teach us that like um, form follows function. So yeah, you do need to make it work first, but then you need to find out what's the shape that makes this ergonomic. What's the shape that makes this last? Um, and that's the fun part. It's also a really, really hard um, quest but it, it's worth it yeah love it and it, it, it end on a bad house situation i love that too adam <laughs> this is great thank great great work so thank you for being up here this is wonderful and i highly highly encourage for people to be able to come over and check out all the great work you're doing over on nerdy.dev i think it's you're doing some amazing stuff and I, I will also quickly plug the work that you've been doing with being able to do the HD gradients. The other one that you mentioned earlier with the Svelte, um framework that's different than the nerdy.dev program. Make sure that people are checking both of these things out. Amazing work by you. So keep it up. Thanks so much, Jen. It was really nice hanging out with you. And Sam, nice hanging out with you too. Appreciate the time. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Thanks for coming on, Adam. This was a lot of fun. So Jen, I got to ask you. What is your big takeaway here? What's the thing that stood out to you about everything we talked about with Adam? I mean, I don't want to sound like a broken record because I feel like I'm, I keep saying it, but um, I've been in the headspace just personally. I'm, I'm in Japan right now and everything is so aesthetically um, intentional and it makes you feel good. It's minimal and the design is just like something at least I'm not used to in the U.S. And I feel like Adam, like, I don't know, maybe he belongs in Japan because his stuff just makes me feel so good. And um, and and I'm. I don't know if I'm not used to that is the right thing to say, but it just feels like a newer concept. And I know as a developer myself, CSS is like not that fun to learn. Like there's a big hump to get over until you're actually good at it. And I'm not over that hump myself. And I just see what he's doing. And it makes me like want to get over that hump because I think once you're really fluent in CSS, you can do some amazing things. But there are a lot of um, different programs coming out that are like 
low code, no code, or like, you know, drag and drop, snap to fit, uh, Wix, like website creators and, and programs that take that part out of it. But, um, but it just makes me want to go back and, and do it like Adam's doing it, because I think it could be so much better when you customize it and you really know what you're doing and you really have the user in mind. And, and um, yeah, I, I just feel really inspired. So <laughs> those are my yeah. take worlds. <laughs> I, I well, I'm good. And it's wonderful when like we feel inspired. We already knew Adam when what we're going to walk into. So it's nice when there's layers and layers and layers this, on this as well. I think the big thing for me with this was I love the exploration that Adam did where like new site, new everything. And like where he basically started fresh. He, like I said, new framework, new way of handling commenting because he wanted it. He was like, let's re even, I mean, he works at a company that does analytics and he's like, but I can potentially do it slightly differently and try out different platforms and see what's possible. So I just like the fact that everything was blank canvas. There's nothing assumed that's yeah. coming in there and trying it and seeing what works. And so I, I really appreciated the fresh takes of a lot of the things that he did. And I hope that many developers, even ourselves, they continue to do that and say, just because we did it that way yesterday doesn't mean it's the right way to do it today. So I think there's yeah. a lot to learn from Adam there. Yeah. And I love that comfy car concept. I, I hadn't thought of it like that. But and also the fact that Adam has gone in and and just poked around and just seen how things work. Um, obviously, that's an incredible quality in any developer. But um, it just kind of goes to show when you're passionate about something, you can just get so much farther and learn so much more. And, and his passion clearly shows and what he's what he's landed on and what I trust he'll continue to grow and continue to land on, continue to explore. And um, yeah, it's just just really, really awesome stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that said, let's make sure that people know if they like this, great, stick around because we got plenty more episodes for you to check out. All of them at cloudinary.com slash podcasts. And it's not the only place you can get our podcasts. Of course, we're going to be on all the various services you probably listen to podcasts on, such as we're on YouTube, we're on Spotify, we're on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. We're on basically, you know, you name it, we're there. And of course, we have years and years of content to go through. So you can see here, we have episodes from all the way from student developers, all the way to some of the best and brightest in the field, like this episode right at the top from Kent Dodds. So make sure to check those out. If you want to see the full library, of course, cloudinary.com slash podcasts. Also, as mentioned before, keep the conversations going. If there's anything that Adam talked about or you've heard about on other episodes and you want to ask other users, are we doing this? Like maybe some of the transformations that Adam went and explored, like F Auto and Q Auto and C Limit, or maybe some of the ways that he was able to do conversions from GIFs to MP4s, anything like that. You can discuss that at Cloudinary's community. So that's community.cloudinary.com. And as you can see, we have a handy dandy Discord server for real time chats amongst yourselves as well. So make sure not to miss any of those. And even though I plugged it earlier, I can't plug it enough. Go check out nerdy.dev for all of the great work that Adam's doing. You can see he's regularly posting content about all the things that he's up to, what places he's speaking at, and of course, just some of the moods that he happens to be in. So wonderful things that are happening in this case. So Jen, any final thoughts before we let our audience take the rest of their day? I don't think so. I think I think we covered it. I don't want to sound like a broken record. I just I just um, I think this was a really fun episode. <laughs> yes, I, I agree. Absolutely. So on behalf of everybody at Cloudinary, including myself and Jen, thank you for participating in this Dev Jams program. And we hope to see you at future episodes where we will talk with developers that are doing innovative, inspiring and interesting projects with images and videos and likely using Cloudinary. Take care. And we'll see you at the next one.